Usually when a new book is released with glowing reviews, rises to the top spot on the New York Times bestseller list and gets a coveted Oprah seal of approval, it's smooth sailing from there on out. But for American Dirt, a novel about a Mexican mother and son fleeing to the U.S. to escape a drug cartel, that mountain of early acclaim quickly yielded to an avalanche of criticism. At issue for many is the author, Janine Cummins, who's neither Mexican nor an immigrant. And then there is the style. L.A. Times writer Esmeralda Bermudez wrote, My skin crawled after the first few chapters. What made me cringe was immediately realizing that this book was not written for people like me, for immigrants. It was written for everyone else, to enchant them, take them on a wild border-crossing ride, make them feel all fuzzy inside about the immigrant plight. All, unfortunately, with the worst stereotypes, fixations, and inaccuracies about Latinos. And Bermudez is not alone. The Internet has been ablaze this week with people making fun of the stereotypes and style. Cummins has also become the target of several threats, forcing her publisher to end her book tour early, releasing a statement yesterday saying, in part, it is a book we continue being proud we have published. We were therefore surprised by the anger that has emerged from the members of the Latinx and publishing communities. The fact that we were surprised is indicative of a problem, which is that in positioning this novel, we failed to acknowledge our own limits. So, when it comes to telling stories about people of color, where is the limit? Joining me to discuss are Tanya Perez-Brennan, a former journalist covering immigrant and Latino communities who's now working on a novel, Nina McLaughlin, author and book columnist at the Boston Globe, and Andre Debus III, the author of nine books, including the National Book Award finalist, The House of Stanley Fogg. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Tanya, let me start with you. Is the problem that Janine Cummins uh, wrote a book about something that she had no firsthand knowledge of, or is the problem that she did a really cruddy job? Okay, that? so I think that um, one of the reasons that this has been such a huge controversy is uh, that, you know, a lot of people um, and some people in the Latino community have attacked her identity and said that, oh, you know, a few years ago she identified as white, even though now she's claiming that she has a Puerto Rican grandmother, and now she's claiming to be a Latinx writer. Um, my take on it is that, you know, I don't think we should be attacking her identity because the way she identifies is, quite frankly, her business. Um, I mean, I'm half Irish and half Colombian, and I don't, I don't think I'd be very happy if anybody were questioning my identity or how I choose to identify. Um, I think the issue is um, the execution, the poor, frankly, the poor execution. Um, and I think she needs to be looked at in terms of the merits of the work itself. And I think um, quite frankly, based on, you know, I haven't read, full disclosure, I haven't read the book covered cover, I've read excerpts and I've read all of the, the reviews, but um, I think the little that I have read, um, you know, I have to lend credence to what a lot of my, you know, my fellow Latino writers are saying in terms of there's a lot of stereotypical language um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of problematic issue with the way she portrays her characters. Andre, you wrote among other books, House of Sand and Fog, which I completely loved. And that was told from two perspectives, the perspective of, if I remember right, an Iranian emigre who was a former general who was now living in the U.S. and a woman from Saugus. Mm -hmm. Were you worried when you wrote that book about trying to inhabit the lives of two people whose experiences were extremely different than your own, or were you not worried? I, I, I was no more terrified than I am when I write anything. <laughs> But I was not worried. I, I, would be, I would be far more worried in today's climate. I just want to back up and just say something. I think this, the outrage that, that um, cultural appropriation is rooted in is justified. It comes from centuries of oppression and rape and genocide and racism. The outrage comes from a really sincere place, agony against injustice. I'm all for it. I think we need to talk about this issue in, in two ways. There's the publishing aspect, and then there's the private creative act of the literary artist. Publishing is 76% white, a new study just showed. 5% Latinx, 4% black, 6% Asian. It's a white industry, and I think that the cultural blinders that rolled out a book in such a large way for this woman understandably have upset a lot of Latinx writers and others. As a writer, I think we have to have total freedom to write whatever we're pulled to write. But then it, the execution has to be there. And with right. Tanya. Yep. But then it's, you have to do your due diligence. You've right. got to write with the sort of empathy and authentic curiosity and compassion that may yield an ethically sound performance on the page. And if not, well, you've got to be able to take it on the chin. My coworker, uh, Azita Giramani, who books the show, is from an Iranian family. And she said that in House of Sand and Fog, you somehow completely managed to nail the Iranian perspective. You got it completely right down to the use of certain Farsi phrases. What research, did you, what research did you do 
to get it as right as well. It was. It, I fell in love with an Iranian woman, and I was immersed in the culture for five years in my life. And I and I spoke conversational Farsi, and so I was intimate enough with the culture that it didn't feel like a stretch, a huge stretch, to try to imagine the life of one of those people from that culture. Um, and that's why. But I think you have to do your due diligence. It sounds as if Janine Cummins did her due diligence, but didn't still some... I have not read the book, so yeah. it's not fair to even comment further in that way. But um, writing is hard on all levels, and doing your due diligence may not be enough. Nina, your memoir, Hammerhead, was about leaving your previous job as a, a journalist, a job at which I had worked with you for several years, and becoming a carpenter. Uh, your new book, Wake Siren, this retelling of Ovid's Metamorphoses from the point of view of the women who are transformed in that classic text, is about uh, power dynamics mm. between men and women and mm. female sexuality. Have there been times over the course of your writing career where you've thought about tackling a particular subject or conceptualized a story or maybe a, a book a certain way and then decided, Actually, no, I'm not going to do that because that really isn't my story to tell. Or has that not happened to you? You know, that I don't think that has quite happened to me. The stories that have sort of presented themselves for me to tell uh, do sort of feel in combination this part coming from the world of the imagination and part coming from my own sort of lived experience. And I think that's the sort of job of a writer is to sort of combine those and who you are and what sort of story you're telling it varies the scales vary depending on the book and the mm -hmm. story um, what forces is getting are getting pulled in um, I, I I agree with Andre that you know I don't I mean if I were to want to tell a story that felt outside my realm of experience like I mean for example like I haven't been turned into a laurel tree um, <laughs> which I write about in this Ovid book um, but I don't think I shouldn't attempt to write about that because I haven't experienced it. It's this right. sort of powerful act of the imagination, which, right. I, yeah, I mean, again, and it is, as, as both were saying, the sort of, you know, bringing the skill level and the sort of sensitivity and curiosity um, and talent to it to, you know, make it true regardless of whether it's been lived. By the way, this might be implicit in everything that we've been talking about here, but, but the dust up over American dirt is part of this much, much bigger conversation going on, not just broadly culturally speaking about cultural appropriation, but in the literary community, right? I mean, my understanding is that people like the three of you who might be interested in doing something a little bit risky in terms of authorial perspective, am I right that there are now sensitivity readers who work with authors yes. to mm -hmm. try to make sure they're asking certain questions? Yes. And it's not, it's not for every book. I think that is for, I think you in some ways have to request it oftentimes, um, that it isn't sort of an automatic every book is right. getting a sensitivity reader. Right. I don't think it's a given, but I have heard that there are sensitivity readers. There are people who are presumably paid to provide this service and to read over the work mm. of, you know, certain authors to make sure that it's authentic or legitimate. Yeah. I don't think we, we uh, I can't remember if you said this, in this conversation or before the cameras started rolling, uh, but definitely before the cameras rolled, you said you're not sure House of Sand and Fog could be written and published today. I don't think my publish, my agent would be able to sell that book today. And, and that saddens me because I worked really hard on it. Um, and, and, and to me, th th this is what really concerns me and really why I'm, I'm on the show. I, I think there's got to be all kinds of outrage against the publishing industry and the um, imbalance and what's, what's rolled out and what's given seven-figure advances yeah. and what's not. Um, but, you I'm know, glad I, you brought I, up the, yeah. the payment. But that's I, a I've been teaching creative writing for 30 years, and, and the last thing I want any of my students to think is that they don't have permission to try to write anything. Right. The risk is you fall flat on your face, you know, and I do think it's an act of friendship to try to imagine the life of another. But you'd better go as deeply as humanly possible. I'm going to say something that's going to sound a little spiritually bizarre. I've been writing for four decades fiction, and I think the deeper we go, there is no other. There is no other. Our experiences are very different. I know I am born white and male and therefore privileged in ways that no others will not be because of the world we live in. But I believe the deeper we go, we are all one. And we, we should all feel free to try to enter into the experience of the other, but we better do our due diligence and we better write with authentic compassion and curiosity. And it's tricky because and I we love can't that. phone it in. I think I that's the key is you have to do your homework. Now, yeah. in Cummins' defense, she did say that she had done five years of research. However, yeah. I don't think that research is enough in a situation like this. You know, I ask myself, I wonder, did she have any Latino writer friends 
did she have somebody that she could send the MS to, the manuscript to, and say, hey, is, am I getting this right? You know, is this correct? Um, and then I have to ask myself, as you go up the rungs of the publishing industry, what about her agent? What about her editor? Right. Why was there no one there you know, during this? Why were none of the gatekeepers able to sort of stop this and say, wait a minute, you know, this doesn't ring true? Tanya, one question for you. I want to let uh, Nina have the last word after that. You're writing a, a novel about the Colombian and Colombian-American experience. Yes. Uh, you're working on it right now. Are you at all concerned as someone who is not exclusively of Colombian ancestry, mm -hmm. but of Colombian and Irish ancestry, that when your book is published, that there will be some people saying, wait a minute, who does she think she is mm -hmm. getting to tell this story? This isn't her story. Right. Um, you know, it's funny because I've been thinking about that more given this whole controversy, um, but I feel very well versed. Um, I've been working on Colombia for years. I mean, my f family is Colombian. I speak Spanish. I lived in Colombia. Um, so I feel like, you know, I have enough credibility, and given also my experience as a journalist, I mean, my book is a work of historical fiction. Um, it's about journalists. So this is stuff that I know very intimately, so I would have, I think I, think I have enough gall to say no, that that won't happen right. to me. But however, right. there, there might be some Colombians out there who say, oh, you know, you weren't born in Colombia. You didn't grow up in Colombia. You know, who are you to talk about, you know, Colombian history or whatnot, but then my argument would be, my mother's an immigrant from Colombia, mm -hmm. my aunt is an immigrant from Colombia, and you know, so that's how I would I would answer that. Yeah. You get the last question, I think. Since you write about books as well mm. as writing books of mm. your own, have you noticed in your work for the Globe and uh, other outlets, have you noticed a shift in the way that people write about radically different perspectives than their own? as those books come across your desk or not. And it, it, you may not have. I mean, you're probably not studying it systematically. But I'm just wondering if you see an increased sense of uh, sensitivity to this sort of stuff. I mean, I know one thing I do as a reviewer um, and for my column that I write for The Globe is I try to pay attention to um, women writers, writers of color, um, uh, to shine light where I can, uh, as opposed to the people who are getting attention no matter what. And I think, again, to go back to the seven-figure advance, the publishing industry pumping so much money into this story, uh, and not to people who aren't getting the sort of attention. So that, that feels as my own motivation as a reviewer, trying to shine light there. Balance it, yeah. yeah. We've got to leave it there, unfortunately. Yeah. I wish you could stick around for an hour. Andre DeBuse III, thank Nina you. McLaughlin, Tanya Perez-Brennan, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.